Hello everyone, welcome to my next video and today I want to start talking about my project that I've been working on about two weeks now and it's a project that I really wanted to make for a long time and it's finally gonna be used for a seminar and hopefully even for the future on my university and it's going to be a good electronic load worthy of a place in electronic workshop and it has to be reliable, it has to be accurate, it has to be easy to work with, so intuitive design, and also the code has to be readable and in good quality, so it can be modular and upgraded, or even other instruments modeled by the code written for this one. So this one will be in some case a prototype for future projects in the instrument-like category. For today I have a prototype that I want to show you, a little demonstration, a little bit about how I went about uh, designing it and a few things that I have going for it and the future uh, questions and what all the complications that arouse I'll have to solve and in the future when the code is gonna be up to par so I can uh, release it to the public I will comment on the code and it's probably gonna be only a current constant current load it's not gonna have yet the constant resistances powers and other modes but that's a plan for the future. So the first thing is to create a modular design so those features can be added rather easily. So let's go firstly to the schematics. So I'm gonna utilize my drawing board to show a little bit around. So you probably saw this circuit all over the internet. So this is a simple dummy load. And I haven't given any values to these components because these tend to vary a lot and it normally and usually doesn't really matter. So what it means, we have a voltage source over here that we want to test, either a power supply or a rail in some kind of system. And we want to test it if it can deliver that uh, amount of power or current. And we want to test uh, for the temperature, st long term stability, ripple and stuff like that. So this is our actual device under test. And from this point forward, we have our device that we're gonna be making and configuring. What we have is a simple op amp over here that compares the control voltage on this non-inverting input to the feedback voltage on its inverting input. Basically what happens, let's say that this MOSFET is conducting and some kind of current is flowing. We can calculate the voltage drop across the resistors with Ohm's law, saying it's the resistance times the current, which if we choose let's say a 1 ohm current uh, shunt over here, we get 1 volt per each amp flowing through it. So this can be the gain of this resistor. And because the rule of the, uh, the op amps is there's no current flows into these pins, we can say that this resistor doesn't really play a role. So the voltage over here is the same as over here. So what happens? Let's say one amp current is flowing over here. We have one volt over here. If we want to have no difference between these two nodes, which is what the op amp tries to do, the op amp is gonna correct its output so the control voltage is the same as the feedback voltage. And if we know that we get one volt per amp for a one ohm current shunt, we know that our control voltage can be from 0 to 1, which represents 0 to 1 amp. So you have a potentiometer divider over here to create from, let's say, 5 volts, a 0 to 1 volt signal over here, and we can have a closed loop circuit. This op amp is going to try to minimize this difference by driving its output in such a way that this MOSFET is going to be turned on just the right amount in order for one amp of current to flow through these resistors. Because remember, MOSFET is not just a simple switch that can be on or off, it can also act as a variable resistor in its saturation region. I'm going to just foreshadow, but this is for a future video. We have a VDS over here, which is the voltage across the MOSFET. We have an current through the MOSFET and for a given fixed voltage on the gate source, so this is this voltage over here, VGS, we have this kind of characteristics. So let's say we want to increase the current, we have to increase the gate source voltage which will transform into something like that. If we want a lower voltage, 
or a current from the MOSFET, we have to lower the VGS voltage. And if our power supply voltage changes a little bit, going left and right, the current won't change much, but a little amount. But the op amp, we see that little change as a voltage drop on this resistor and we'll adjust its output. Fairly simple circuit, can happen to oscillate, so that's why people put this resistor and capacitor over here, which basically acts as an RC network, which just dampens the rate of change of the feedback, so in order to this op amp to not oscillate along with the MOSFET switch. This is just a fancy notation, so the load that you want to set is equal to the control voltage times let's say for 1 ohm, it's 1 over 1 volt per amp, which gives us a control voltage times 1 amp per volt, so control voltage volts and volts cancel, and we get amps on the outside. The problem is a different resistors, and if we have a larger resistance, we get a larger voltage drop for a given current, which means that we can have more headroom to move over here, but that's a problem, because with larger uh, resistances, the power goes through the roof. The power consumption on a resistor equals to current squared times the resistance. So you can see the higher and higher current follows the square power. So that is a problem. So with higher and higher currents, we get more and more power consumption on these resistors, which can turn into more power draw on these resistors than on the MOSFET. And we usually mount this MOSFET on a heatsink in order to keep it cool and to dissipate the wasted power. Because this is a dummy load, so this has to waste power. But it's very inefficient if we have the wasted power on the resistors, we can change its resistance with the temperature and also changes our references. And we also have to keep this one cool. It isn't more simple to just keep one component cool and one as cool as possible and to have it stable for our references. That's why we need to choose a lower and lower resistance. But with lower resistance, with the Ohm's law, comes a smaller feedback voltage. And with even smaller feedback voltage, let's say 10 millivolts, we get dangerously close to the power supply rails and usually have a single supply, let's say 3 volts to ground. And most op amps, well, all op amps behave very uh, unexpectedly or at least poorly around the power supply rails, especially the ground one. So not a lot of op amps can go very near the ground. And most, if not all, have very hard time around very small signals. But we have a 10 millivolt shunt, which means 10 milliohms, which means that 0 to 10 millivolts equals 0 to 1 amp, which gives a lot of room for noise to come in and to ruin our design. Because 10 millivolts is really not that hard to adjust, you have to have large resistances over here, lots of noise, and little room to play around to set carefully your current. And I want to set my current carefully and concise. So, what is the solution? Well, this is one of the approaches that I'm using right now. This is the current schematic of my prototype that you saw on the first picture. And this is basically the same circuit with a modification in the feedback path. Instead of just the resistor value going straight into the uh, inverting input of the main comparator op amp, I'm having a difference amplifier over here. So it's an AB packet, so it's the same op amp, in this case uh, OPA2333, which is a very excellent op amp, but in the later case we're gonna see that it still struggles around zero, so I'm trying to mitigate this in the future. What is happening over here? I have a current chant over here that has a special design inside, so it's actually made for current monitoring. Basically, if we look into the current chant, we have the big chunker line over here, and it turns it to a resistor. And then we have another set of lines that go directly to these points. And the manufacturer has trimmed and assured that the difference between these two points is exactly the resistance that the device is sold for. And in this case, this is 20 milliohms. So it's guaranteed from this point to this point to be 20 milliohms, which means that no matter how much current can draw, if we measure the voltage over here and we have an ideal voltmeter, no current is flowing, which means that we're not stressing these parts over here, 
means that we can get a very accurate measurement of the current flowing through these resistors instead of including all the wires. Because if you were to measure, let's say over here and over here, we would also include this small part of the wire and the contacts of the package. And with these low resistances around milliohms, these wires don't become negligible such as with one ohm shunts as we saw before. So that's why it's important to use the proper package. The next one is the difference amplifier over here, which in this configuration, when these two pins and these two pins, uh, uh, resistors, sorry, are the same, we can calculate its gain by dividing the feedback resistors by the inline resistors and we get around 31.9 gain which is great because we saw that with lower resistances we get much less voltage per amp but now with an amplifier we can get in this case around 0.63 volts per amp on the feedback output and then we have the same circuit over here a feedback uh, dampening circuit in order to prevent oscillations these values have been deter determined experimentally so that the circuit behaves well at these values. And then I've added not yet this capacitor, I haven't tried any of this yet, and a free kilo ohm resistors for the pull down, so a little bit stronger pull down, and a free 60 ohm resistors uh, so not to overload the output of the op amps because if you know, the uh, MOSFET is actually a, quite a capacitive device. So if a large change in output current, let's say we go from 0 to 1 amp control voltage, we can get a lot of change of voltage and lots of change of voltage on the capacitors is lots of current. So we don't want to overload our op amp. Here's just input filtering, clamping in order to reduce noise and in the input. And this is the control voltage that we'll be applying from our microcontroller. So here's the rest of the drawing. So this is the actual volts per amp amplification of the system consisting of this resistor and this amplifier. So this is the R sense times the gain. And this is 30 over 47, so a whole number. And this is our K or amplification. So in order to provide it with a correct control voltage, or which is the same as feedback voltage, because the op amp is trying to keep these two values the same, we can say the current that we want, let's say 0.5 amp times this constant k we can get around 0.315 let's say volts so this voltage has to be applied onto the control voltage input in order to expect a half an amp going through this resistor and the other way around for the measurement so we want to measure the current to display on our display we have to measure the voltage that's coming over here and divide it by this coefficient k and we can get 47 over 30 amps per volt measured volts and volts cancel so we can get amp scaled by this appropriate factor in the future i'm going to be showing this one as well so this is really handy for uh, determining the different effects that can cause on changing voltage references you might be familiar that adcs and dacs uses voltage references which determine the operating range for the input binary value for the output value. And if this changes and your code doesn't know the change, the output values can be a little bit different. And in short, instead of one over one, let's say we want one volt. So this is the binary input command and this is the voltage out. Let's say we want one volt and we want to have it on the output one volt. If the voltage reference over here is smaller, we get smaller output. But if the voltage reference is higher than we anticipated it, the voltage on the output will be higher and this leads to linear offsets over uh, here. So it's important to have stable voltage references, which value you know in advance. And it is the same with the ADC just backwards. So that's why I drew this so you can look at this and think about it, uh, walk around the room, think about this formula so you can see how all these values affect what you know. So this is the computer side, so PC let's say, and this is the analog side. So you can know what you know and what's really happening. So firstly it all started, let me enable the drawing. So firstly it started on the breadboard as always. 
I have my current chunt over here. It's a little bit different right now, but this is how it was in the beginning. Here's the MOSFET mounted into a little heatsink in order not to overheat. We have gate drain and source over here. We have a gate source resistor, which are replaced then with a gate, uh, uh, gate earth connection. And then we have the source, which is the output going directly through this current chunt resistor and then through the ground. So this is ground over here. We have the sense terminals over here going into the different amplifier, which is the first half of this amplifier package. And then the second half is getting here is uh, I had a potentiometer for the control voltage input. And here it's using the measured output voltage of this one to compare it against. So I could characterize it and confirm if this circuit would work. And when I was happy with what I had, let's go to the next picture. I built a prototype on this board, which is currently sitting on. So I have yeah this one, which is more uh, illustrative. So I have this open and I have this female header, these better ones, so I can change and swap out these resistors. So these are the uh, feedback resistors. So these are 4.7 ohm and these two are 150 kilo ohms and this is the input for the current regulation and the output and this is the feedback capacitor that reduces the oscillations and this is the pull down resistors so this is the gate drain and source let me get a better color here we go So the power comes over here. So this is the plus and goes over here into the drain and then comes out of the source, goes through the first pad of the sense resistors, exit out the last one and goes to the ground. So this is the minus terminal and these are uh, vertical connections so I can monitor with the multimeter. And then the other portion of this resistor is the sense portion and I use these thin wires in order to connect them to the input of our different amplifier. So this is how it looks all hooked up. So let me show what I have. So I have on gate drive a one probe of the oscilloscope in order to monitor for unnecessary oscillations. We have plus supply over here, minus over here. We have a common ground over here so I can connect all of the devices that share the ground. So this is the multimeter ground and here the multimeter plus. This is measuring the actual input uh, feedback from the actual current amplifier. This is the control voltage input. So I can uh, control and measure all of those uh, all the time when it's operating. Here's the supply and here's the MOSFET on this adapter. It's not ideal, it's probably gonna break its legs off, but for now when I'm testing, this is plenty fine. And when it's gonna be working, and I'm gonna try measuring higher currents, I'm gonna have a little bit beefier wires directly soldered over here to an external heatsink. And now to not to make this video too long, I wanna just show you the demonstration video. And in the future videos, I'm gonna show you and talk about the code and how I went about designing that part. So, we start with the video. So let's just tell you about what I have. So here is the OLED display that I'm having. It's displaying the red voltage bus. So this is the voltage from over here to here. So this is the voltage applied at this input. The current, which is sent from the voltage output of the amplifier connected to the DAC. So one of these pins, I think this yellow one goes to the ADC input. And the other, uh, the green one goes to another ADC input. So I'm uh, limiting myself to voltages. If you can see 2.7 volts, so up to three volts, which is the maximum for the STM32. And then I'm calculating the power by multiplying these two. I have the real time clock running over here. And currently just uh, I set uh, with a cursor that I can change the set cur uh, current and it can go from zero to one amp. So I'm limiting myself to one amp and I have 1.1 amp set as a current limit on the supply in order if something goes too bad. I have my multimeter in millivolts over here measuring the control voltage. So you can see this is the probe of this uh, multimeter over here and this red wire, the control voltage comes from this board and over here I have a DAC, I think a 16-bit Maxim chip and here is a 
crappy voltage reference around 3 volts uh, that kind of drifting all, the, all over the place but this is the best that I have right now. So you'll see how these parameters uh, change. So this deck is controlled over SPI to change its output control voltage in order to change the current which is the one that I want set over here. So let me now play the video. So I'm firstly I'm turning on the output of the supply and you'll see that a small current is already running. This is a fairly new power supply and I'm certain that it's very accurate and also you could see that this voltage over here changed. As I said, op amps, even if fancy ones, don't work well near zero volts or near its power supply. That's why a little bit offset goes around, it's amplified even by the difference amplifier and then the offset is amplified by the driver one and the result is a little bit turning on at the MOSFET. Here I enable the output, so I have an output enable, which enables the new values of the current set to pass to the deck. So this is kind of a enable output sleep mode. So now it's turned on. And now we can change with these uh, buttons over here. I have buttons for plus, minus, and the center one will change the cursor. So I'm pressing the second one. So from right now, because I only have one button, this just rolls the cursor in one direction. And by pressing the plus button, it increments the current digit. In this case, I incremented it to 10 milliamps. And as you can see, by incrementing it by 10 milliamps, I'm increasing the current. This is the readout display, but you can probably see what happens over here. So I'm gonna have 100 milliamps and this one reads 103 milliamps and this one around 101, 103. The measurement is fairly accurate. I'm using the built-in 12-bit ADC of the ST32 to measure the voltage and current, but to set it, I'm using the DIC on the board. For some reason, on this dev board, the DAC outputs were having a 75 milliohm, uh, millivolt offset, which is too much, so I'm using the external one but uh, the voltage reference, the crappy voltage reference is causing it to have a slight uh, offset, but the internal of the ST32 is very accurate. As you can see with also increasing, oh, I focused on the display, so you can see that the actual 103 milliamps are flowing and I'm going to be increasing by 100 milliamps. As you can see, it stays fairly consistent, so very accurate. So this is with poor voltage references and one amp. So this is the limit. So uh, 994 milliamps, 95, and the current monitor says 998. Uh, remember that the conversion from the voltage readout to the current on the display and from the desired current to the control voltage is the same. The coefficient is the same. Just the voltage references and the ADC and DAC change which can also change the accuracy of this tool. So I found out that this monitor is more accurate than the DAC. So by uh, changing the cursor around, I can change to any current I want. And in the future, it's gonna be two buttons so you can move the cursor both ways. So let's say I have a current of 760 milliamps, 757. Close enough for now, really good results. As you can see, I'm focusing back and forth in order to check the values. And you could also see the control voltage over here. And if you were to divide this 447.2 millivolts by that coefficient, which is for around 47 over 30, you could get the actual set current that I set over here. And by toggling the enable, you can see that even though I've set 700 milliamps, the output turned off and it's drawing around 3 milliamps and then I turn it off. Also, while it's running on a higher current, you can see that the voltage provided by the instrument is guaranteed to be 2.7 volts, while on my monitor it says 2.574. I also did the uh, check. This is because we have resistances of wire. This lab banana plugs have around one meter length and we have one for positive and one meter for negative. So that's around 170 milliohms drop on these banana plugs. So it's natural to have a sound voltage drop when you have a lot of current passing. So you can see this is the current state of the project. 
uh, I hope you have some inspiration from this project and some uh, advices on the future. In the future videos, when I have time, I will release a few more commentaries on the design and philosophy of how I approach the code design. And I'm also gonna be sharing my code with you on GitHub in order to better it to not only offer the current control, but constant power and resistance. These are the main ones that I want right now, not really all that battery monitoring stuff, just a solid current power and constant resistance. So I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.